And so now I'm going to start the video with Sophie. Sophie, are you online? Let me check. Hi. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Um. Yeah. Cool. So she's gonna she's gonna be here for questions. Do you want to say anything before you get started? Yeah. Thanks everyone for um letting me show this recorded video. It was in case I missed my flight, but it turns out the flight issue wasn't a thing, and the issue was me. Um. So uh, I'll, I'll be here for questions. Um, and if I feel better halfway through the week, I'll plan to try to be at AGU. But if not, you can always email me or I'm on the CryoCloud Slack as well. So uh, thanks, everyone. So this is going to talk a lot about um, open source software and how you can um, publish your tools, store your tools, and data. Uh-oh, let me make sure I'm sharing the right way, share sound. That's not right. There's someone. One day I'll figure out soon. Hello, my name is Sophie Galieber, and I'm a postdoc and program manager for the GHUB project. Uh, thank you for watching this recording. Okay. If you are watching this recording, it's likely. It's, yeah, can we turn off the microphones? Because I had a flight delay and wasn't able to make it in person. So thank you for your patience with that. Um, today, I'll be talking about publishing tools and storing data with GHUB. So to start with an overview. GHUB is a science gateway that provides resources to researchers, educators, and students focused on ice sheet and polar sciences. So that includes paleo, modern ice sheets, data scientists, modelers, anything in between. We host and share tools, data sets, and resources with the goal to unify ice sheet and polar observations and modeling, to uh, bring scientists together, make our lives a little bit easier, to share science and data in a more reproducible way. We're supported by the US NSF and EarthCube, and our cyber infrastructure is handled by a company called HubZero, so this is an open source software that was developed at the University of California, San Diego. It was specifically designed to help a scientific community share resources and work together with one another, um, <clears throat> including tools um, for sharing data sets, interactive simulation tools, uh, and the ability for you to um, work in collaboration with one another. So this is a very simple schematic of the uh, GHUB infrastructure. Uh, you know, we have sort of modeling data sets that are um, sort of in the cloud or source code maybe is shared on GitHub. Um, and, you know, scientific research and resources are, are all over the place. And so one of our goals is to bring that all together on GHUB. And so uh, we have educational resources, tools and high performance computing resources. Uh, data sets and community building tools. And we want to be able to disseminate that to scientists, students, teachers, and the general public. So first up on the list of resources that we have are tools. 
So tools are a type of computational resource that you can create, publish, and share. Um, essentially, it's a way for you to share your scientific code in either you know, a simple Jupyter Notebook interface. And so you can have an interactive code with documentation. Uh, if you have a code from a paper that you'd like to share in an executable way, if it has data stored alongside of it, we can take that all in and then put it into an executable environment so that your um, research is more reproducible. We also have um, more complex workflows that use our high performance computing resources and really detailed user interfaces like we have on the right here with this workflow for crevasse detection. Um, and this, the user doesn't see any code at all. A graphical user interface was built on top of that and the user just gets the data. And so we can associate background information such as citations and documentation with your tool and release it all um, in a citable way. We also accept data sets to GHub. So GHub can be used as a repository for data products that are generated during your research. And we have large data sets um, that can also be made for computation staged on the computing cluster. So for example, we host the ISMIP-6 um, ice sheet model intercomparison project for CMIP SIP data set uh, and other derived data sets. So what kinds of data do we actually accept? I will say that GHub is not a traditional data center or DAC distributive active archive center. We're not like NSIDC. Um, we do not have people who are dedicated to sort of um, management of the database itself. Um, so we sort of break it down into um, two types of data sets that we accept and can store for you. Uh, so we host large data sets such as model output that would normally be too hard to share. So for example, we have the ISMIP-6 forcings and model output, um, which is very difficult to put on a Zenodo, uh, maybe really difficult to work with. So we are able to share it on our HPC system. So users can um, either access tools that use that data or work with us to develop new ones. We also have things uh, that we call derived data sets. Um, these are uh, computed or extrapolated from other existing data. So in this instance, all associated data sets are you know, cited. Um, an example of this is our GIS ready ice bridge ATM L2 um, elevations, slope and roughness data of the Greenland ice sheet. So uh, this is a case where the ice bridge data was um, processed, it was cleaned, it's GIS ready for Greenland. Uh, and instead of uh, just storing it on uh, their own computer, a collaborator went in to make this uh, available to folks, uh, and so they store it on GHub um, for people to access. We also share other linked data sets. So you do not need to host your own data set on GHub to have it featured. We include links to other data sets and distribution centers. So even if your data set is already published somewhere else, maybe it's on Denodo, maybe it's on NSIDC, but you still want users to be able to see it. Uh, we would like to share it on the website. So even if it's not hosted on GHub, we would like this to be a one-stop shop for all polar uh, and ice sheet uh, science. Um, so please absolutely share that with us. GHub also uh, has a education focus. And so we have education modules that can be housed and launched directly in GHub for school-age students up to university-level students. Um, uh, or can even be used for outreach. We also have uh, <clears throat> the uh, we also have introduction to R and Python, uh, and you can learn to code in our environments um, without needing to install anything. We also have this feature called courses, so you can create or turn an existing course into an open source uh, course offering on GHub. So this allows for online and self-paced learning, or you can have um, synchronous meetups uh, through the, the courses as students enroll. And we are actively seeking individuals or groups who want to deploy courses on GHub. This course here, Introduction to Python for Earth Science, uh, will be shared in summer of 2024. And so if you have students who are interested in uh, this, it'll be self-paced, asynchronous, uh, but it's sort of the, the first course that we have shared on GHub. So 
in a similar way that um, CryoCloud works, we also have Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter Lab instances that you can run on, on GHub. So it just launches from your web browser. Uh, and so we have kernels in Python, uh, Octave and R. Um, you can access your own files or store files in project repositories that we have on GHub. You can also run your own Debian 10 Linux workspace. And so the difference here uh, with GHub than with CrowdCloud is GHub isn't going to be necessarily as useful for your day-to-day -day work. These environments are mainly for developing tools that you want to archive on GHub. We also have access to high performance computing at GHub as we make use of the computing and data storage facilities at the University of Buffalo Center for Computational Research. And so this is used to run certain complex tools or workflows and house large data sets. And Hub Zero actually provides the functionality through this submit function that enables users to execute certain code codes on the CCR compute cluster. Uh, we also have fast parallel Globus utilities that are used to transfer uh, GHUB data sets in and out of our storage space. Now I'm going to go into a little bit more depth on tools and the tool um, sharing process, why you may do it, and how you could get started. So why would you want to deploy on GHUB? So most people uh, post their source code maybe on uh, GitHub, um, maybe you share it through CrowdCloud, um, maybe you uh, you know, send a Python notebook file via email, which is really awesome. But in some cases, users then have to download. Some cases, they have to unpack and compile and install that. If they're using Python, then they have to figure out to, you know, make sure the environment works. Uh, all to make sure, in some cases, all to just, you know, uh, adapt your code maybe for something else or, or to apply workflow to their own work, you know, and something can go wrong. So GHUB offers an executable environment for you to share your code. Um, your tool will be running in a remote server environment with its own file system, so we can associate data sets with it. Um, all user interfaces that we have for our tools are built in Jupyter Notebooks, and tools run in a web browser. So on the right here, this is an example of a tool running in what we call app mode, where everything has been built in the Jupyter Notebook setting, so you're coding in the cells, and then it runs and it looks like a really nice clean app um, where someone's developed a, a graphical user interface on top of it. So uh, about these user interfaces, as I just mentioned, we have two different tool deployment, deployment styles. We have notebook style and tool or app mode. So the notebook style, excuse me, notebook style, all code cells are shown. So in this example on the right, uh, from a paper in 2021 from a uh, someone from GHUB uh, deployed their code from a paper uh, showing this uh, statistical model. They wanted it to be uh, executable, uh, easy for someone to access and read and, and clearly see that what they did, but not necessarily um, uh, process the data on their own. And so this is an example of a notebook style tool that essentially is, is kind of a tutorial on the, the code that they have. We also have tool or app mode. And so this is something I shared earlier where code cells are hidden, but the user interface widgets are visible. So in this case, the, the backend code is completely hidden and users don't need to have any coding experience to then access these um, workflows. They can sort of run the workflow and get whatever data that the um, tool developer wanted to share. All the user interfaces are built in Jupyter Notebooks using IPy widgets and Hublib. Oh, it looks like I'm missing a B there, so that should be Hublib. Uh, and Hublib is built off of IPy widgets um, for from Hub Zero, and so this gives users the ability to you know upload, download results, um, click options, uh, and essentially get an output without needing to code anything at all. And GHub offers support for building user interface for your code. So you don't need to figure it out all by yourself. So we always get the question about DOIs and GHUB does not currently mint our own DOIs. Part of this is the cost and the um, uh, many other needs associated with being able to mint your own DOIs. So the way we've sort of gotten around this is by using a community on Zenodo where you can create your own DOI um, for your resource 
um, we can actually create it for you and have it linked to the GitHub community. We then list this citation on the tool and resources landing page. So when someone uses the tool or gets data from it, they will cite the tool itself and the Zenodo citation so that there is a DOI associated with it. So one of our more complex tool examples that I'll show here uh, is the ATM-based crevasse detection and extraction tool. So the data for this tool is actually sourced from NSIDC. The analysis was performed on GHub, and then it plots um, and gives you outputs directly to the to the user. And so this was actually a tool that was developed uh, by Kristen Poinar at UB and her undergraduate student when they had a publication come out in, 2000, uh, in 2023, this year. And so this is that same user interface that I shared where now you can go on and do the same analysis that they, they did in their paper without any coding experience uh, and it can be shared with others. And so you can do this with your research as well. If you have a workflow that you think it would be really useful and you wanna make it a little bit easier, uh, we can work with you to make these uh, user interfaces. So what's the actual process of getting started on this? Well, you can go to GHub and create an account. You'll go to our top menu bar where it says tools and you'll navigate to how to contribute tools and you'll select an option to get in touch with the team. So you can schedule a meeting with me you can share, you can fill out a resource form and we'll get back to you, send us an email. After you've done this a few times, you could even potentially develop this on your own, but I highly recommend you talk to us first um, so we can help you um, with the publication process. So the actual process after you've decided that you want to share your tool uh, and get it going, uh, we have this nice little flowchart that shares sort of what you do on your side and what GHub and Hub Zero do on our side. So you start the process by filling out a form that tells us about your tool, including the tool name and version, who you want to run the tool, and who can access the code. Of course, we always encourage open access. Uh, we want things to be fair. We want things to be reproducible, especially. Uh, but if you are in development mode and you don't want others to access the code until it is ready to share, you can set that to be um, private. And then at the end, we can always change those permissions. The Hub Zero side will create a project area for your tool. Um, this includes a wiki for project documentation. We use Git source code control, and we also have a ticketing system for bugs or any issues you have that goes directly to our Hub Zero um, uh, support desk. You'll get told that your project area is created, and you'll upload your code uh, via Git into a GHub workspace, um, and you'll then uh, Final test and commit these changes to the repository. And so you do all this testing in GHub's Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook environment. We can also pull directly from GitHub if you have the directory structure we need. So if you don't want to go through the process of developing something new, you already have something on GitHub, as long as you have the certain files that we need, which we can go through with you, um, we can also pull directly from GitHub. Once your code has been uploaded, um, you know, we'll get it installed. You can launch a tool and test it. You can make any changes that you need at this time to the code, to the user interfaces. Then it goes back to our side. We reinstall the tool with the latest code. Uh, and this process repeats until you're happy. Then we get to the, you know, intermediate stage between this like updated and approved. Um, once the tool is sort of to your satisfaction, we'll have members of the GHub editors team um, we'll test the tool. We review for usability and offer suggestions um, for changes and improvements. Um, developed, developers can add additional tests or criteria that they would like editors to review, and um, they have full access to the review process. Essentially, what we do is we fill out a form and we send you those um, edits, and you can accept or reject any of those. And at this point, uh, the DOI process starts, where we start um, getting that DOI on Zenodo for you that we can then put in the documentation. Finally, once we uh, finish everything, the tool looks good, uh, we publish our tool. You know, we take one last look, make sure it works. We double check the tool information page, set the licenses, and then publish your tool. In the future, if you ever need to update your tool, you have new capabilities you'd like to include. Um, essentially, we just uh, update the changes, reinstall the tool, change the version, um, and then the new version gets published with an updated DUI. 
So something you may be thinking is uh, we've been talking about CryoCloud today, maybe cloud tools. Um, and now we're talking about archiving maybe finished products on GHub. So how could a CryoCloud tool work on GHub? Well, to test this, uh, I took the Earth Access tutorial uh, from <clears throat> the CryoCloud book. So you may have seen this before. Uh, I really like Earth Access and I wanted to make a short tutorial about how it could work on GHub. Um, so this is the CryoCloud tutorial and over here on the right, we have the GHub tutorial. So as I said, we adapt this tutorial. The main difference between uh, CryoCloud, the CryoCloud uh, tutorial and GHub is the ability for direct access in the cloud. GHub is not running in the cloud or on an instance of AWS. So while the direct access functionality from Earth Access does work, it is slow. So the adjustment that we can make with GHub is to store the data locally for tools. So all tools will get a data folder um, where they can store larger data files. Uh, and so essentially uh, in the workflow, which I'll go through in a moment, um, you're instead of directly accessing, in this case, ISAT2 data, uh, and doing you know, your plotting or your analysis, you're downloading that data locally, doing your analysis on the tool. Uh, and so it's not fully interoperable uh, and we are working and we'll hope to work with CryoCloud more in the future on how we can get CryoCloud and GHub to talk to each other a little bit better. Um, but we believe this means we're moving in the right direction. There are ways to adapt CryoCloud tools that you want to share or archive on GHub. So this uh, video is just scrolling through the example of the uh, notebook that I shared. Uh, so essentially most of the text is exactly the same. Um, I just indicate in the text where things are different, um, you know, the main differences between the CryoCloud and the GHub tutorial uh, and how to use them. So in the first part, you know, we're importing the packages that we need, authenticating using Earth Access in the same way, querying the ISAT data sets, printing the collection information. The next step, you know, we're searching for the cloud hosted data set using Earth Access in the same way, searching the data set using spatial and temporal filters and displaying these results. And then finally get to this part at the end that says um, uh, not recommended on GHub and recommended on GHub. So the first part is the direct access to open, load, and display the data stored on the S3 bucket. And so this will run, but it will be very slow because we're not running in the cloud. So instead, the way this tutorial works is uh, using the Earth Access download module where you're actually just gonna download that um, uh, the ISAT2 data to your shared data folder, um, which <clears throat> you can temporarily store data in and remove or have permanent data that's associated with the tool as needed. And then uh, in the last step, um, we can show that XRA data set and then plot the data in the end. And so the main difference is the direct access um, for GHub, it runs a little bit more like classical computing, um, but you know, moving in the right direction. So this is what I was sharing. The direct access will work and it's supposed to be pretty quick, but because we're not in the cloud, it takes more like five to six minutes, whereas downloading is very quick. Um, we can access the ISAT2 data in that way download it to a local folder um, for the tool instance. So what next? Um, if you have a tool, as I mentioned, you can head to the tools um, page and uh, click how to contribute and then choose an option and we can chat. Um, we have a survey that you can fill out here that uh, includes an email list. So if you include your email, I can uh, send you updates about GHub. Uh, you can send an email here at ghub.gateway at gmail. Uh, we also have a couple uh, YouTube tutorials that you can check out. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, if you have any other questions, just let me know.
uh, thank you so much for listening. Do we have any questions online or in person for Sophie? Yeah, Amy. Mm -hmm. Sophie, the question was whether um, the notebook that you adapted um, into GHub, is that located now on GHub? Hi, yeah, um, it will be, hopefully, Hi, by the yeah, time I'm looking be, for yeah, our yeah. partners to make that, uh, we had to update Python for Earth Access to make that yeah. kernel live. Um, once it is, I'm going to make sure that uh, Tasha uh, can email it out to all of you, um, and I'll post it in the crowd cloud um, Slack channel. Well. Um, one of the cool things that we're working with GHub on is trying to figure out a how CryoCloud can pot or how GHub can potentially wire into CryoCloud, and you know launch their notebooks in CryoClouds if they have something that's uh, meant for the cloud, and then the reverse if there's a way to wire into their um, high performance computer for larger scale kinds of um, computations. And, and to do that from CryoCloud. So if you, you create some data or want to stream some data into an X-Array and then run it into HPC, is that possible? And so those are some of the tools that, that we're discussing and, and trying to figure out if we can create um, with GHub. Yeah, and I- Any I, other questions? I'd just like to add to that, that um, well, one, thank you again, Tasha, for organizing this. Um, and, you, if any of you have ideas of things you want that like connect to and GHub, I'm sure, uh, not to speak for Tasha, but I'm sure both of us would love to work with you to figure out what's going to happen. Yeah, any any um, tools that you think that we need? And I think that's that's one of the cool things about working with on CryoCloud where you have people running all of these cool like pieces of in infrastructure, creating the tools like Jessica's online, creating ice picks. Scott is helping to create a lot of different tools that we've seen today, like the GRIMP um, tools are, you know, in development, all of these things are being created. And so if you want to do something and it's not available, uh, definitely reach out to us or to them. And um, I mean, that that's how the development's going to happen. Um, so it's a really nice uh, kind of interconnected network we kind of have for that. Um, everything's expanding really rapidly. 